It's been a fascinating range of discussions so far today and if any of you were here earlier you'll remember we started out with David Blunt talking about regulation and that is where we come full circle. Um, one of our panellists earlier commented on the fact that, that most people turn up to work in banking and financial services just wanting to do a good job, they want to do the best for their customers. Yet 10 years on from the financial crisis and almost three years since, at least in banking, uh, the introduction of the senior manager and certification regime, there's still a noted discrepancy between the stated values uh, of firms and, and what is being seen in practice. And this remains a focus for the regulator and a key concern of consumer representatives. So with the help of my panellists today, we're going to look at the challenges of improving culture and discuss whether technology can help meet not just the rules but also that underlying spirit of the conduct regime. So I'm delighted to be joined, I should introduce myself first of all, I am Shona Matthews, Head of Regulation at the Charter Banker Institute and my esteemed panel today uh, is formed by Patrick Butler. Patrick is a former British diplomat and investment banker where he was Head of Global Strategic Projects at HSBC, GCIB. EMA Head of Global Banking at Compliance of, uh, at the Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Patrick has also founded Calitor Limited in 2012 and through that he advises and coaches executive committees, boards of global and national financial services firms and through that enhances their internal compliance functions, helping them build effective conduct and culture enhancement programmes and strengthening their risk management practices at all levels. Currently, he is co-founding the faculty of the UK Finance Conduct Risk and Culture Academy, which was launched earlier this year. And that brings together both retail and wholesale banks to build uh, practical ways to meet emerging regulatory expectations through advanced behavioural understanding and practical expertise. He also provides bespoke regulatory risk management development courses to financial institutions and key partners. And interestingly, He's uh, just been telling me a bit about this. He's a non-executive director on the board of MIRISAS, a Norwegian real estate company which uses decentralised technology to innovate financing of clean energy real estate projects. And he also advises Arcadia Lending, a start-up peer to SME lending platform. Beside Patrick, we have Sarah Hitchens, who is a senior associate in Allen & Overy's Litigation and Investigations Group in London. Uh, Sarah's specialism is in internal and external investigations with a particular focus on financial services firms and listed companies. In her experience, she has also completed a secondment to the Enforcement Division of, as it was then, the Financial Services Authority and was selected by Global Investigations Review as one of the top 100 women in investigations. So much of her time is spent looking at uh, the implementation of the UK Senior Manager and Certification Regime, advising banks and building societies in relation to a range of post-implementation issues, such as assessing potential fitness and propriety issues and breaches of the Code of Conduct. She advises senior managers in relation to the meaning of reasonable steps and advises firms in relation to their governance arrangements and general compliance with regards to SMCR. In addition to this, she's also experienced in advising clients in relation to skilled person reviews and management of <coughs> FCA supervisory visits, in particular with relation to financial crime and market abuse. And finally, but certainly not least, is Callum Grant, who is Product Director at Trail Light Compliance Technologies. In his role, Callum focuses on the SMCR and competence and conduct management. He defines and drives the product roadmap to help firms tackle the regulatory and business challenges facing financial services industry. You won't believe it, but Callum has a 37-year career and that spanned various roles in insurance, retail banking, including customer advice as an IFA and then specialising in T&C, people performance and risk management. Before joining Trail Light, he led the training and competence uh, for Aviva UK and Ireland. He's currently chair of the Training and Competence Strategy Group, which engages directly with the regulator and firms across all the sectors in financial services. And he is a member of the Expert Advisory Board of CPD Standards Office, and Callum is a fellow of the Chartered Management Institute. You may note, if you are watching your programmes carefully, that uh, we are missing a certain Mr Ed Smith from the Financial Conduct Authority. Ed would very much like to have been with us, but there has been something else going on today which has called him back to the office and he is unable to join us. But I don't think that should let us stop asking some big questions. So if I might start 
by asking each of you, but I'm going to start with you, Sarah, because Ed's not here. <laughs> is it possible for regulators to tell if changes have really occurred or are firms simply using technology to find new ways to do just enough to comply? So that is a big question. I personally think that regulators are pretty sophisticated when it comes to looking at technological solutions. I think the FCA itself, from what I've seen at least, has spent an awful lot of time and energy looking at how technology works well and also less well in a number of institutions. I would say that the regulators are now in a position where if they see that a firm has put in place some technology, it's not just, oh great, they've got a technological solution, they've made some sort of change, tick the box. It's much more a case of actually then delving behind that technology, how it works, what it's really intended to do, does it actually achieve that in practice that the regulators are looking at. And with then an SMCR kind of lens across that as well, what oversight and insights do management have about how that technology works and the reliance they place on that technology, is that really warranted? So that's kind of my, I'd say, kind of initial instinctive reaction to change and the role that technology plays and how the regulators might see it. But I know obviously, Callum, you actually spend your time designing technology, so may have had other feedback in terms of how people have used it. Yeah, uh, we kind of look at it from the outputs and outcomes perspective. And <clears throat> I think the regulator is particularly interested, and David alluded to this first thing this morning, and what senior managers are doing around their duty of responsibility uh, and what reasonable steps they take to govern and manage their business effectively. So I think a lot of that for me is certainly focused on the data that technology produces that senior managers with specific responsibilities in the business can tap into to make informed decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I think we touched on in the last session, whether that data is actually um, looking at crystallised risk and stuff that's really, really super important right here, right now. Or more importantly, I think how data starts to build up a picture of what could happen if certain interventions aren't put into place. So that's where we come from in terms of the software we're building um, to help SM and CR, a massive focus on the reasonable steps aspect. Um, and then also how other forms of data will inform fitness and propriety for both senior managers and the volume of certified staff that will be in scope. I think that becomes super critical because as an annual process, that's starting to look at right down to people level, where we're collecting data around people, what that's telling the business about whether that individual is actually fit, actually fit and proper. So that's a combination of professional uh, data, but also behavioural things where firms aren't necessarily terribly sophisticated yet. So uh, I think I, the outputs and outcomes are the key focus for me and how that ties into that duty of responsibility because the consequences of getting that wrong for senior managers are dire. Um, you know, it, it's bans, it's fines, it's jail sentences, et cetera, et cetera, potentially. And um, we've also already seen, I think, you know, over 100% increase in the number of individual censures that have taken place in the last 12 months, which is a huge change from firm focused um, censure. And Patrick, when you have outputs, does mm. that then give you the ability to measure what's going on? Uh, some would say that the outputs are the measurement, or could be. But, uh, but yes, I mean, the key thing is, as you say, you get the data. You'll, the data that you get through technology gives you two things, I suppose. The ability to have more information, hopefully better information, if you're, right, if you're asking better questions, that allow you then to make better decisions. And that's the key thing, and that's what you're talking about. That's the outcomes that the FCA is looking for, uh, is the decision-making that flows on from that. Uh, so those end up being the outcomes. Um, and I guess the key is that although up to now we focused, and particularly the senior managers themselves because of the fear factor, have focused on what it means for them in terms of personal accountability, um, there have been uh, encouraging signs, at least from the FCA, about taking this to a new level. So it's not just about stopping people from doing bad things, mm -hmm. but actually driving better business practices that drive actual real, real sustainable value in the industry. Uh, we talked about this a little bit before, and I just wanted to introduce that now, but it's, it's um, a discussion that when you look at the behaviours that underpin the conduct that we're trying, the misconduct, shall we say, if you take the other side of the coin, i.e. the converse, the, the good side of it, the positive aspects, if you're able to encourage those, including using technology to do it, 
those are the behaviours which are going to drive sustainable business value. It's going to be things like collaboration and innovation, understanding your customer better, all the things that we talk about as being beneficial for firms. So I, I, and I think the regulator is going down that route as well now. So they're yeah. starting to see that, look at the technology, how it's being used, mm -hmm. as you say. Um, a couple of years ago, we had a conversation with the, um, with the heads of the sections in, uh, in the FCA, the supervisory heads, and they said, yes, lots of technology, lots of monitoring systems. Everyone's spending billions. That's all fine, but fundamentally, what we need is we need an underpinning of understanding of a change in mindset. We need people to behave in a different way. So what they, the technology does is gives us indicators, and it can give us indicators, but how do we get that to, I guess, and this is the question we're asking today, drive an, a, a, the outcome of better behaviour, which is inside all of us? So driving down into that a bit more, um, uh, Sarah, you've touched on this, about the, the, the way that developing, you can see that sometimes there are new risks evolving. Um, what, how do you see that taking forward? Are we going to see um, new ways of, of taking those new risks to develop new behaviours to, to action and address? You deal a lot with uh, supervision and enforcement areas. Are, are people learning from those mistakes? I think they really are because the FCA for a number of years has been going on across what they call read across. So if they take action against one firm, making sure other firms think, hmm, how could that impact me in my business? Likewise with individuals as well. So I think people are definitely learning lessons. I think there still is a variation in the quality of lessons learned though, and the actual then way in which people go about implementing things to demonstrate they've learned those lessons. And I think technology can play a real part in that. We were talking um, earlier, just taking SMCR as one example where technology is really developing at the moment. You know, we've seen a number of firms that, you know, not just in relation to SMCR, but a whole host of areas relied on very manual monitoring and tracking of certain metrics, which were very, very important for their business, very important for regulatory compliance. And it was, you know, big named institutions who you'd think would have some sort of wheezy system in place when actually it was a person and a spreadsheet that was prone to sort of failures, was very manual, open to a lot of risks. And I think actually SMCR being a really, really great point um, or example of this, where technology really can play a valuable role in learning lessons where things perhaps have gone wrong. So to take one example, some of the bigger banks in this country have thousands of certified persons. It's no mean feat to try and actually make sure you certify all of those persons on at least an annual basis, capture all the different data points that may well need to be weighed or balanced in relation to actually assessing their fitness and propriety. But it's all about actually having a system that works, not just in isolation, but alongside all of the other systems that particular firm has for HR, for training, to actually make sure it does what it's meant to do. And I think that's where I have seen in some cases firms thinking, to Patrick's point, you know, I've spent you know, X million of pounds or X thousands of pounds on this really wizzy system that looks great, but actually, have I really used it properly? Does it really fit the problem that I'm looking to solve? And I think that's where sometimes with technology, I have seen firms still trip up slightly. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think um, we're speaking to more firms now who are trying to get their systems connected up, uh, whilst at the same time trying to remove legacy systems. Um, you know, uh, we're in the business of, 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 of um, hopefully um, doing lots of business with, with financial services firms. Let's not ma make any bones about that. But the reality is as well that their procurement processes have, have become far more robust. And I think there's more centralised purchasing going on, whereas historically business units, business areas, divisions within groups have been allowed to do their own thing. And I think that's caused disparate sets data sets kicking about some better than others and actually uh, firms and senior managers in particular weren't gaining that collective view of their business very effectively so i think we're seeing more discipline um, around how they're using technology how they're procuring it and actually the typical cycle for us is about nine to twelve months to get from initial conversation to agreement within a business so you know that due diligence is really important as part of that, we, we then work with the firm to look at how we can create connectivity between typically HR systems, LMS systems, training competence systems, etc., and plugging that in because there's a natural relationship with the things you need to assess around F&P. Um, so that, that's, that's been a big shift in my personal experience over the last sort of 12, 18 months. I mean, that's to your point about risks. 
I mean, that's, those are the new risks, aren't they, that are being created, that um, perhaps there's an element of overconfidence. Now this is all automated, I don't need to worry about it. But then times move on, things change, and the system is no longer fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you're not actually focusing on the fundamental issues. That's a, a real risk. And the opportunity, but also the, the additional risk, is the, is the lack of, holistic, of a holistic approach. When we, in the academy, when we talk about conduct and culture and the methods, the frameworks, the tools that you can use to, to enhance it, what we focus on is a holistic approach around the organization. It's about a mindset. It's not, this is not the responsibility of compliance. Mm -hmm. In fact, forgive me, and as an ex-compliance officer, mm -hmm. forgive me even more, they're possibly the least qualified people to do this because it actually, it, it actually has a sense of the entire business going forward. And, com and the compliance function has an opportunity to change itself, but, but HR being involved, finance being involved, absolutely the senior managers and XCOM and the strategic decision-making process has to be involved to allow them to make wider, better decisions. Uh, and in some cases, have the courage to look back and say, actually, the way we did things before, we need to change that. And we have to accept that we have to change it, and we didn't get it right. Yeah. Um, sorry to interrupt here, but I mean, <coughs> again, there's a lot of feedback coming out to say that the bankers have found SM and CR really cathartic, because some of the key elements of that are really pinning on key senior manager functions onto individuals, which describes and encapsulates what, what they're there to do. But more importantly, the responsibilities that sit underneath that. And there's a number of responsibilities prescribed by the regulator that points to things like conduct and culture and pins it on to executive managers as well as non-execs. And I think trying to f for firms to start going through that process of flushing that out and actually saying, what does that really mean? How do we articulate this? Who's got responsibility for it? I mean, you know, we, we've, we've heard of firms getting, getting the, the board, etc., locked in a room and, and they spend three or four days with flip charts and post-it notes trying to thrash it out, um, which means that they didn't have that clarity before. So I think the, f the regulator would echo that, I think, but actually I'm hoping that the insurers and the FCA solo regulator firms will go through a similar kind of process because that process of saying, well, that is what it means in our business and that's what I'm responsible for is absolutely critical. Where in the past, um, and one of the reasons for the banking crisis was surely that senior managers were actually claiming that they had delegated it all the way down to poor old Mrs. Miggins in the canteen, who all of a sudden became responsible for international banking. <laughs> um, and, and again, that's what the regime is trying to sort out, to say it, it, it's, that's where it sits. And then the associated documentation that's produced about that, and that Sarah's alluded to, is, is there to help the regulator, but very importantly the firm, to understand how it's governing itself. So it can make adjustments, it can use the data uh, and intelligence coming from their technology more effectively. And I'd absolutely echo that. Like We <coughs> advise quite a number of the large banks and some building societies in relation to the first wave of SMCR implementation. And at first they were like, oh gosh, what is this? Is this horrendous? We're going to have to like, you know, work out actually who is responsible for what within a firm and have some really difficult conversations. And quite a lot of FCA only authorised firms are in that sort of place now. But to your point, I think you're absolutely right. If you went round and asked all of those big banks now, actually having come out the other side of it almost you know, three years into it, do you think it was actually a beneficial process? I think they'd all turn around and their senior managers and would say yes. Because yes, they did have to have some difficult conversations both within their own firms, but also with you know, head offices and all sorts of things. But actually they are the better off for it because there were sort of blurred lines in terms of what people were responsible for. Lots of delegation to people who perhaps didn't know they'd been delegated to. Yeah. And uh, I think those were things that absolutely, from my background doing investigations, there's nothing that irritates the FCA more than when they start an investigation and when they ask who's responsible, people go like this. So actually, I think the regulator's happy and I think firms are actually better off and admit that for it. Let's linger on the prescribed roles for a second because uh, those in banking, a new one came into force at the start of this month and particularly with the theme of this panel, uh, the prescribed role is for ensuring conduct yeah. rules are met. Yeah. Should we be relying on technology to help with that? 
I think technology has a huge role to play in that area, and I'm not going to steal the thunder of the person who actually designs the technology, but at least from kind of the perspective I have of advising a number of senior managers in relation to kind of their arrangements, but also this particular prescribed responsibility. It was one of those ones that it's kind of odd they didn't include it to start with about reporting training in relation to the conduct rules, because although everyone knew about it, it was very important. Going into a number of banks, it certainly fell by the wayside because even though you had senior manager responsibilities, the fact it wasn't called out in a specific prescribed responsibility, I think meant it sometimes got deprioritized. And you know, I've had clients who have all singing or dancing training courses to do with conduct rules, but actually one client, when they pulled the MI to see had everyone done it, yes, everyone had done it, but it was a training course that was meant to last 45 minutes and they could see that people had just got to click through it and that some people were getting through it in like 45 seconds. And so actually when they were drilling down into those types of metrics, I think from our perspective, we thought they might have taken a little bit too much reassurance from the fact they'd bought all this amazing software to do this training, had a list saying, yep, everyone's done it, without necessarily drilling down into the detail of it. Well, this goes into Rebecca's point earlier about looking at how someone has gone through, mm. uh, in their case, the integrity training. But for, when do you introduce the human into uh, I suppose you're, you're very much driving the, the culture and yeah. uh, behaviours um, well, through the I academy. I agree with Re I, I do agree with Rebecca, and this is something we discuss with our academy members um, uh, quite regularly, is that training is not a good metric. Having done the training is not a good metric. The fact is, what you need to be asking is, have our people implementing it on the ground? Have they changed the way they act? Mm -hmm. Now, is that a measurement that you can use technology to, to determine? Well. Not entirely, unless you actually are going to put chips into people, as I think there's been some discussion recently. Yes. Yeah. So the banks are going to put chips in all of us, <laughs> so they know exactly where we are and what we're looking at on the screens. Uh, apparently, that's the case. Um, so until we actually get to that highly potentially unethical point um, uh, of evolution, uh, the fact is you need to look at the outcomes of how people act, um, and there is a blend of of real behaviour, which is human, as Rebecca was talking about. The, the fact we have to rely on the human skill set that we have is in terms of, of um, observation, understanding, um, emotional intelligence, um, but also use some of the technical s uh, solutions that we have available, like what you do. But there are others out there which look at observed behaviour, and then they are able to um, consolidate that crunch it and provide reports to determine the extent to which the observed behaviour you have in your organisation meets what you desire and what the gap is. And that exists. That, is, that, that now does now exist, that, that capability. And it's done on a very rigorous basis. Now, unfortunately, it, you can't at the moment get the cameras and the motion sensors and the heat sensors to do the measurement of those behaviours yet. Um, but what you do, you, you can do is you can do uh, some very appropriate um, uh, questionnaires, which are not sentiment questionnaires, which get people to observe things on a binary basis. It's been shown to be very rigorous from an academic and a, and a statistical perspective uh, that you can, you can start to see it. Now that becomes MI. Well, you asked about MI earlier. The MI that you have with that tells you as an organisation if your senior managers who are now not only responsible for ensuring that the conduct rules are being followed, but also under the discussions that we had earlier this year in February on, on culture, transforming culture with the FCA, that the managers are driving culture and they are responsible. And they are actually able to make a difference because they can see where the gap is and then they determine what they need to do to shift the needle. So, and those decisions may, and this is where I guess what this conference is about, what extent can we therefore then leverage technology to help nudge? I think your, your point about banking is using technology to nudge behavior. Yes. And, that's, and using nudge, which is behavioral psychology. It's a, it's a book on it. I would say that that's great, and I'm reassured by that, but I don't think that's necessarily new. Um, some hi historical regulation has encouraged firms to actively assess and observe um, the application of knowledge and skills and as time's gone on, more of the behavioural stuff. And, and that's something that we're able to do, is, is to create the tools, or firms allow the firms to, to create the tools they need to do that. And therein lies the root of the problem. Uh, firms find it really, really difficult sometimes to define what good looks like. So there's this nebulous view of great culture, super conduct and, and, and standards. But actually when you get people to sit down and try and think, what, what are they so that you can educate your people on what they should be delivering against or to, 
and then you can start putting the measurements in place. And th that's very often where it falls down because you haven't got that definition right, therefore you cannot measure it and you can't take, bring data in from various sources to inform how you're doing on that, mm -hmm. on that on, against these standards. Um, and that's quite a common problem, but I think, um, you know, and that's where I come back to, you know, so much of this is about the human being, how that, we've talked about professional qualifications and professionalism and codes of ethics, but actually the challenge really is, how, how is all that knowledge being applied in the business or critically with the consumer, either remotely or directly? Um, and I think that's why I'm not a massive um, fan of relying purely on professional qualifications and self-attestation as a means of saying you're fit and proper and competent. That's where technology can support that with, if the data is, is well informed against the defined standards, bringing that together to say what's that really telling us in the round against lots of different metrics. Um, you know, whilst I absolutely applaud high standards of qualification, it, that's not enough in my book to be fit and proper. Um, and we need to think that one through as, as uh, and I think professional bodies have a job to do there because um, there's a hell of a lot of emphasis on PQs rather than the skill sets, the behaviours that go with that necessarily. I mean, how do you test whether somebody has adhered to the code of ethics annually? It's self-declaration by and large. It's, it seems to that we call it what actually happens. Yeah. <laughs> right? So what actually happens on the ground, and that's an observation. So what you do in the classroom or on the, on the online is one thing. Uh, and as we Curiously, I've said to a couple of clients, just because you put it on the intranet doesn't make it happen, yeah. right? If so only that's important. <laughs> yeah, if only. So here's our code of conduct. These are our, these are our values. Yeah. It doesn't work. You've actually got to get people in a room and talk about it so they actually understand it. Again, understanding human motivation. Now, the technology that is there can, um, as you say, this is not new stuff. The thing is, we have organisations which are f far more and and an industry that moves far faster than it ever has because of technology, because of communication technology, um, algorithmic trading and so on, um, you know, payment systems, and again, the disruption in the payments for the, for the, for the banking, as opposed to the investment banking um, sector. The, the fact is that the technology is there to keep pace and to bring that data together and give you insights into what is actually happening in far-flung places that you can't see. So you can't go and watch Johnny all the time, or Sarah, just for the sake of argument. <laughs> Susan, um, but because you've got, in some cases, 150,000 people in your organisation and they're all working in different cultures, different countries, and you need to find a way that, that the fundamental bases of the standards meet all of them. The only way you can do that is for them to, to define it themselves based on guidance because that's where it is, fund is ultimately going to come from. E in each person, there is the, f is the basic ethical knowledge. I think we... Sorry. I'll stop. I'll stop there. I was going to pick up on the rules, but we can well, we can we can get to back bring to standards them in again because uh, recently some of you may have been involved with the the FCA's focus. Uh, they had a discussion paper on whether or not the the sector needs a new duty of care, and as part of that discussion, and and I think where Ed here, we could start looking at some of the outputs from the, the FCA run tech sprints. Now, David earlier this morning alluded to it. Unfortunately, we don't have Ed here to, to further that. And these are not to be confused with the, the culture sprints, which I think will learn from tech sprints to apply that yeah. in culture. But if we bring the two, the outputs there and the rules, one of the, the interesting areas there is how machine learning can perhaps improve the understanding of the individuals working. So the individual actors own understanding of what rules, which principles actually apply to them under the regime and enhance this understanding of their personal accountability. Because let's not forget, it's an accountability regime with many facets to it. So looking at it that way, do you think if we take machine learning to help take out some of the nuance and uh, who wants to read the handbook? Certainly no one I've ever met. <laughs> Will that help achieve better outcomes for customers if we have a much simpler understanding of what is expected of me working in the sector? 
from a regulatory perspective? Does it ever currently get to the individual undiluted? I think there's a couple of issues with that. And actually, the tech sprints that you've described are very, very focused on fintech, looking at new routes for consumers to access financial services. Um, what, what you've also mentioned there is machine-readable um, rules. Um, the FCA is going through a process at the moment of, of doing a proof of concept around where the, they can create machine-readable rules that firm systems can interpret and produce data that will feed into Stratford through APIs and, and um, a blockchain, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But one of the key challenges, uh, if you think about it, is that a lot of the old prescriptive regulation from previous regulators has actually disappeared and has become principles-based and outcomes-focused. So when you've got loose <laughs> um, descriptors of what you should try and achieve, rather than this is what you need to do, I think that's one of the problems they've got, is turning that regulation into something that isn't written in a language that a machine can read. Or, or, or software can it's read. The of the so, so what happens then? You know, how do we are we going back to prescriptive regulation? Because if we take it, the, the proof of concept is focused around regulatory reporting, by and large at the moment. But if we extend that into some of the rules that sit around SMCR, for example, or or people or fit or anything like that, how do you translate that into something that a, a, a bit of software can read? because you'll lose a lot of the intent. Um, and we could have a long argument about principles-based regulation. But I think there's a great, pro there's a really some good stuff going on with the regulator in terms of acknowledging that technology needs to play a better part um, and has a role to play. But there with that will come major difficulties, I think. So it may be a bit of time before we get to that machine readable piece, to be honest. And I think just on that point, if we were to try and get to that machine readable piece kind of too soon, to your point about principles based regulation, we often have clients coming to us asking for sort of, you know, solutions or definitive guidance in terms of how they could decide this or that, like fitness and propriety, for example, for certified persons. And you can give them criteria, you can give them guidance, but you can't legislate for each and every situation. And I think there is a danger there that, especially where tasks are kind of pushed down to more junior employees who perhaps don't have the regulatory experience and the background to actually understand not just the letter but the spirit of the rules as the FCA loves to say sometimes you get into a danger of having a tick box mentality where people say well it's not x y and z therefore it must be this and actually there from my enforcement background you can see how you know the FCA may well have its cake and eat it they like technology they want to encourage it but nonetheless they're quite quick to point out when they see examples of things or behavior that they don't like and I can certainly see that being an area where they would like in the future if they see that kind of trend to bring a case to really send that kind of message to the market? Yeah, and, and, and again, good thing Ed isn't here. Because, <laughs> I mean, we, we talk about the rules, but again, I think in some ways we, we're almost distracted by it. So when we talk about rules, what, the reason we have a principles base is because it actually allows you to flex with, exactly. the, yeah. with the environment, which is great. It's tough for the banks because they have to basically reverse engineer um, outcomes into their own processes and management, management um, dynamics. But if you actually, again, flip it over to the value question, and what you do is instead of saying, these are the rules that apply, and these, you must reach these minimum standards, you say, no, 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 we as an organization, we're not going to take that role. What we're going to do is we're going to say, we want to go to here at least, because A, forget about the fact that we're ticking the box with the regulator and getting things right and not doing anything mm -hmm. stupid. If we go to here, we'll actually serve our clients better. We'll have a sustainable business and we'll actually do what, is, as a bank, is our fundamental role, which is to support economic growth and, and, uh, and, and, and social evolution, effectively, as the lifeblood of, life of, um, of trade and finance and, uh, and so on. So if, you, if, you, if technology can tell you where the minimum is, that's great. But the fact is that that, again, is just information like training. Um, what you really want to do is have a way in which you can use technology in some ways to help nudge the behavior and then to track the behavior to tell you that you haven't reached, I sorry I was doing it here, you can't see, there's the rules, you know you want to get up to here, the technology can tell you how far between here and here you are and also whether you're down here. And if you can use it for that then it really does help you to drive the spirit of the of the of the regulations and what they certainly what the FCA is trying to do as a conduct regulator, 
on that, we've David touched on earlier about the new uh, directory of individuals and, and we and our alliance partners have challenged that there should be much more information about the professional standing because as professional bodies we would argue that we help fill some of that gap between the minimum. We would never settle for that, we'd push our members to go and exceed. So thinking about that and, and talking about Nudge and directing everyone to our recently uh, launched Advanced Diploma in Banking Leadership in a Digital Age, if we're looking to stretch people to take that, that next step further, where should we be focusing when it comes to the use of technology in, in banking, particularly in financial services more widely? Is it in operational resilience, sustainability, um, models for risk? Where do you think we should be focusing to help the future leaders of these organisations in a digital age? Designs. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll look at the Old TNC hat I, on, I, Callum. I would say it's risk and compliance, but I think, in terms of education, um, I think w let's take the population we've been focusing on, uh, you know, to a greater extent this afternoon, and that is the senior managers. Um, I, I'm not so sure it's so much about how we educate them on mm. technology, but it's how they use the products of technology. Um, from, from the risk and governance perspective to manage the business more effectively. I think that's one, one aspect. The other aspect is how they can leverage technology to deliver um, uh, a more efficient and effective consumer experience, but also how they can leverage technology to generate um, more commercial success because we got the, it, we've got to accept the fact that organisations are there to make money. And striking that balance is important. So I think there's a whole range of things, you know, in that mix. But I think some senior managers will, if we're talking about loads of data and maybe far too much, is how do they get through that and understand what that means and how do they interpret that and how do they then make informed collective decisions in boards and committees and individual decisions as part of their reasonable steps. A few years ago, I was working on a project for a client, which was a, a, a conduct academy. And I was phoned by somebody, again, an alumnus of, a play, of an academic institution I was at. And he started saying, um, is there scope for something we're working on in finance? And essentially, he was in the Cambridge cluster of technology. And what they were looking at is using multiple, um, using AI and machine learning um, to build a picture of behavior within an organization. So they would use, again, uh, word recognition for phone calls. They would look at email checks, and they would look at uh, things like sick leave and when people came in and, and uh, need app pass activity and how many times they bought a cup of coffee and so on. And this is, again, based on the ethical discussion we just had earlier. You know, this makes some people a little bit uncomfortable. It's a bit like putting the chip in to, and so on. But they actually have the ability to do this, and they built this approach. And what it does is it builds you a picture so that you can see what the status quo is. And therefore, the value in that is that when things change in a particular group, in a particular country, in a particular business, substantially, it sends up a little red flag. And that red flag may say, actually, these guys are really working well. They are, it, by the way, it's also linked, can be linked to your revenue production and costs. But it can start to say, these guys are making a hell of a lot more money than the other group. Their behavior has changed in this way. Let's go and investigate. And the investigation is not necessarily to find uh, evidence of wrongdoing, but to find out the real cause for that change. And is it something we want to encourage and foster? Is it something which it actually is against our principles and in not in the long-term interest of this organization? But that's where technology can really help, I think. And I've seen some other ex examples of that, so for example, in relation to trade surveillance, yes. um, you think kind of mostly recorded telephone lines were to capture things from an investigations perspective where things went horribly wrong, you know, market abuse, kind of inappropriate behaviour, those kinds of things. But in this day and age when actually there's a lot more focus on culture, behaviour in the office, bullying, harassment, hashtag me too type things like we've seen Megan Butler speak about from the FCA quite recently. I know there are systems out there that can take sort of the status quo of the volume at which somebody speaks on their telephone and assess whether or not they are whispering, which may indicate that they are up to no good because they want no one else to hear what's going on, or if they are shouting, which may indicate they are bullying somebody, and all sorts of things that actually, when you put it together, is really a scary, albeit very rich picture, in terms of how somebody might actually be behaving. And I think actually some of the big banks are getting more and more 
keen on that kind of idea just because the number of investigations we've seen um, in the industry where bad things have happened, like rogue trading scandals that have resulted in millions or even billions of losses. And if you trace back in those people's history, there's usually no one single incident where they did something bad before because they probably would have been fired for it. But there's lots of smaller things like, you know, perhaps, you know, banter on chat that doesn't get picked up, you know, perhaps not doing their training properly or clicking through it too quickly and that type of thing not being picked up. And you can just see kind of the crescendo of those smallish red flags suddenly then resulting, not in all cases, but sometimes into something really, really bad. And I think firms really are waking up to the idea that technology is a great way of trying to track all of those different metrics. And to your point, not just looking at each type sort of individually, but trying to put together a much more holistic view of what is going on within an organization organization because ultimately that is what the FCA expects firms to be looking at. They don't think it's an excuse to have only looked at a certain part of a data or looked at it in silos. They expect that holistic view and they expect it from senior management. Yeah. And in the week when the FCA have published their most recent review of, of whistleblowing mm -hmm. speak up, speak up, uh, Patrick are you aware of other or best, best case scenarios where, where you, you've seen this kind of uh, use of um, empowerment in a fast-changing environment? Some of our clients do talk about it. They have some very good approaches. And a lot of it is to do not with technology. Because um, I think we saw, it, if, you, if you had Radio 4 yesterday morning on the Today programme, talking about whistleblowing. And examples in the NHS where um, people just did not feel that they could speak up about things like poor maintenance, which actually, in one case, ultimately ended up with somebody not being diagnosed with a treatable form of cancer, by the time they found it, it was untreatable. Um, and this individual was then slapped with a gagging order, um, so couldn't speak about it even once they left. Now, that is the sort of the very bad side of whistleblowing and speaking out. What we've seen with a few of, our, of, uh, of the participants in the Academy, and the discussion is all under Chatham House rules, so we have different banks in the room actually sharing experience, real experiences of good and bad, so that they can learn from each other. And one, one's actually described the fact that in their organization, they have real communication with senior management. There is complete openness. So that uh, at executive committee meetings, they literally have a balcony and people can turn up and just listen and watch and then give feedback, right? So what it does is it gives people a sense that they can speak and they can be critical of management which allows them psychologically to be able to speak up to their managers when they think something can be done better. And what that does, again, remember I said, let's turn it on the other side. So what that means is you can say when you think something is wrong. But what it also means is that people are more encouraged to come up with great ideas, to innovate. And that innovation will be to the benefit of the organization. So there are one or two who do this, and they have some really good programs uh, within, the, within their banks to do this. Now, these tend to be more, uh, tend to be, the retail and, uh, and uh, a few um, wholesale, less investment banking uh, operations. Um, and others are starting to learn from that. But, your, but what you described just then about this multiple of attitudes, it made me think of the previous conversation and rules. Yeah. So we said, uh, Andrew Belly said, you can't make rules which change culture. Well, hang on a sec. What are socially acceptable standards, socially acceptable norms? which is what actually makes us decide whether or not to do something in the street, whether or not to kill somebody or take money. Or Those are rules. They're social rules. Mm -hmm. And the fact is that if you have technology to help you to identify when there are little rules, mm -hmm. little norms which are being breached or which may indicate a pattern and a, a, an indication of a trend of behavior, then it tells you that a rule is likely to be broken. It becomes predictive, not after the fact. Exactly. And that's exactly what you want to do, because through doing that, as soon as you stand up and say, no, 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 hang on a sec, are you okay, is something wrong? Why are you doing this? And you do it as a colleague or a line manager, it nips it in the bud, it tells everybody else. The message is very powerful as to what the rules of this organization are. M much more powerful than any policy or control mechanism can. And the technology will help those managers have the courage to do it yeah. because they can see that information. What happened with the Forex scandal? I mean, managers didn't see anything. Yeah. Compliance didn't see anything. 
they just didn't notice it because perhaps they weren't trained to do it and they didn't see the, the long-term pattern of behaviour that had changed. One thing I found really interesting with the FCA's feedback on whistleblowing was there clearly is a role for technology. So, for example, when it comes to whistleblowing, obviously one of the biggest things from an employment perspective is, it, is if somebody blows the whistle, you're not meant to subject them to a detriment or any sort of victimisation after they've done that on the basis that they're a whistleblower. And you could see from kind of what the FCA said in terms of good and less good practices that they liked it where firms actually tracked some people who had been whistleblowers to make sure that you know their bonuses hadn't suffered and that couldn't be linked to the fact they'd blown the whistle and those kinds of things where you can absolutely see there might be a role for technology to play in helping to track those things behind the scenes. But actually one of the things the FCA called out as kind of good practices that they really liked was the fact that the whistleblower champion for one particular bank, so an actual human being, went and spoke to some of the people who'd blown the whistle to actually understand how they'd found the process whilst blowing the whistle but also afterwards and I guess for me that just stood out as an example thinking ahead to today where you know maybe technology is not gonna make us redundant from all of our jobs quite yet because I think the FCA does still in some circumstances appreciate that more human touch which perhaps we're not there with machines quite yet until they put chips in us obviously. <laughs> and also you need that for people to feel comfortable exactly. and to give you the yeah. feedback the genuine honest feedback that you need. Exactly.